This is also an important principle that we use for um, video coding. Um, basically, we can produce any visible color by mixing uh, the primary colors accordingly. And um, to show you this principle, I already have this little example, um, image color disk, which basically shows you the principle, and I will show it to you. First, I'll open it with an editor. And here you can see what it's doing. So it's actually not doing really much, as you can see here. It basically creates um, three rectangles with different factors here 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.1. And each rectangle is for the corresponding primary color. Right? And then they're displayed together. And then what you can see on the screen is a rectangle with a corresponding uh, color mix. So, and we will keep it open until we press the key Q. So, and then now let it run. Let's say Python. So now you see this rectangle. Right? So we see that this particular mix that we just entered with those factors gives us this greenish color. Right? And now I can actually change those factors, for instance, um, make it more reddish if I increase this factor here, say go up to 0.5. And now I execute it again. So now we have this brownish box instead. So you can see by changing those factors, we get different resulting colors from this mix. Right. Make sense? So it's actually quite easy. And to make it interactive, I wrote this little Python script here. So I can also open it and de edit. Color mix. So here you can see it gets a few more lines. And here we again have those three rectangles, um, which you can see here. But now we have um, an interactive setting of our factors, which you can see here. So depending on the keys that we press, we increase or decrease the corresponding factors of the different color components. So here is R for red, so we can go up or down with the red factor in steps of 0.1 if we press A and Y. So these are to left those keys on our keyboard on top of each other. And the next one is then for the green component for S and X. These are the next uh, up down keys, the next keys on your keyboard. And finally for blue, um, we do the same thing with the keys C and D. So the next two keys. So in this way we can do it interactively um, using OpenCV. And again, this um, holds, this is open until we hit the key Q, and then it closes the window. Right. Here also, in this text, it puts a little explanation on this box, uh, so that you know what to do. And then you have a nice interactive demo, which you can see when we execute it. So, here's now our window. Maybe it's a little bit small. So here you can see the text with a little explanation. And then we can see those two rectangles. Now they are not exactly on top of each other, but slight, slightly shifted so that you can see uh, the effects of the different superpositions of those colors. So you can see on the top left hand part, you have the uh, rectangle for the blue primary color, then on the right, the 
green primary color and then down the red. And in the middle, the square in the middle, shows you the superposition of all three of them. So right now it's in the middle. I think every uh, primary color has a factor of 0.5. And that means we have uh, a grayish color. If all color components of all primary colors have the same intensity, we get some grayish non-color um, superposition. Right? And now we can use our keys. So, for instance, starting with the red, increase the red. Now it's full at one. So you can also see the mix in the middle has more reddish color. So now the next one, the green, I increase the green. So you can also see the superposition between red and green is yellow. And now finally the blue. So now I'm up with 1.0 for the blue. And now you can see the superposition of all three of them is white. So again, not a color, but white. So it went from gray to white. So you can see we get something black and white if we choose the three factors for the primary colors equal. Could be all three point one or all three point five or all three one point zero. And then the superposition of all three of them is just a gray scheme. So in this way we can use a color screen also to display black and white images, gray scale images. And this is also a good indication of when we have a gray scale. If all three factors are equal, then we have a gray scale. If all three factors are not equal, we have some color. And the kind of color that we have depends on the composition on the three different factors. Make sense? Okay. Then we can press the Q and go back to the slide. Yeah. Right, so they all have the same factor, only brightness changes, but not the color. So that also means we can, if you're only interested in the color type, you can choose an arbitrary definition for the brightness. If you set the sum r plus g plus b to be some fixed constant, then we don't change the brightness, but only the color. So this is uh, an important definition which is used for representing different colors. Yeah. So how do we get the corresponding relationship of the basic colors to each other? For instance, on websites in HTML, HTML, colors are given a six-digit hexadecimal number, as you can see here in this example. Each basic color or primary color is represented by eight bits, and one hexadecimal is four bits. So we have to write primary color. hexadecimal is 4 bits. So for instance, we have AAFFCC that each pair gives us a factor from one primary color. Right? And this um, hashtag in front of it um, tells the um, computer or the compiler or interpreter that this is a hexadecimal number. Um, so this defines the number for so maybe you have seen this kind of definition at the beginning of a website, for instance, to define the background color of this website. So the question is, how do we know the basic colors of, um, of a monitor or camera, or how do we determine its color space? Right? So we can again basically try it out. Um, and for this we can construct a color space whose axes are hypothetical outputs of the red and green cones of our eye. And they are normalized to the range from 0 to 1. And basically, the remaining to 1 in the sum is the blue. So we have x plus y plus z equals 1. And 
This is also um, called a CIE, standard color space. So the result can be seen here. So some of the axes down here are color. So on the horizontal axis, you can see the factors from 0 to 1. You could see if it was not color. And vertically, you can see from also the numbers, the factors from 0 to 1. And the horizontal corresponds to the red cone of our eye, the vertical corresponds to the green cone of our eye, and the remaining to the sum of 1 is the output of the blue cone. So this is now normalized much to uh, what we have on our display, uh, basically what our eye is doing. But this basically corresponds because the display tries to excite certain cones in our eye. So you can see we get different colors depending on the composition that we have. So here you can see those different colors again, um, depending on how strong each cone is excited by the corresponding um, color or color mix. And here in this picture, you can also see the so-called black body proof. Have you heard about the black body radiation? So what is black body radiation? Yeah. Black body is a hypothetical object that is completely black and has a certain temperature. Mm -hmm. And by physics, you can determine um, what sort of light is emitted by this black body. Mm -hmm. And this is some, usually some kind of white, so it can be a warmer tone. The temperature is low because then more infrared light is emitted, but it can be some cooler, some white light in color if um, yeah. more blue light is emitted at higher temperatures. Right. Yeah, so that's correct. So basically we assume we have some some body which is which appears black, which means it doesn't reflect light on its own. Right? That's why we say it's black because we are only interested in the radiation it emits. And the radiation it emits depends on its temperature. And you can actually get a, a function which tells you how intense the radiation from each frequency is. So when we have a cool body, then uh, the radiation is uh, mostly in the infrared or maybe in the radio frequency range. If it's more hot, then it becomes visible because then we have more components appearing in our visible frequency bandwidth of our eye. Right? So our body needs to be hot enough for us in order to see this radiation. And this is, for instance, why we see um, hot metal. Like if we have really hot metal, then it glows reddish, right? like from a um, metal manufacturer. We have some reddish appearance if it's really hot. And this is because then this radiation um, becomes high enough in the visible range for us to see something. And it appears reddish because it comes from the lower frequency range. And red is at the lowest frequency range. Yeah, so infrared is a fairly large range. And for instance, when we have a radiator in the winter, we feel that it's warm even if we don't touch it, but just be close with our hand to it. So these are uh, the electromagnetic waves that those radiators emit that we feel with our hand in the infrared range. So you could also uh, argue that radio waves are infrared, range, uh, infrared waves because they're emitted by those black bodies. Right. And it's actually, they, they radiate with, uh, radiators radiate with quite a lot of power. It's usually something on the order of two kilowatts that they emit. So it's quite a lot. It's much stronger than or smartphones, which usually transmit on the order of 100 millivolts. Okay, so such a radiator is more than a thousand times as, as strong. Uh, two kilowatts, yeah, I mean, so it's actually 
is 10,000. So here you can see how this black body then looks like. So this is basically taking the spectrum that is radiated from the black body at a certain temperature and then shows how it appears to our eye. Right? So here you can see this red curve has some numbers next to it. And those numbers basically tell us the temperature in Kelvin. So Kelvin is basically Celsius uh, minus uh, uh, plus 275. So it starts with zero Kelvin at the absolute um, the zero um, at the coolest point. So at these temperatures, it doesn't really make a difference if you have 2,000 or 2,000 uh, Kelvin or a um, little bit less in Celsius. Just give you that much. So here you can see when, it, when you're at 2,000 Kelvin, then you have a kind of an orange glow. And this is about the temperature that you have with uh, um, incandescent lamps. So you have filament, um, current uh, flows through this filament, and it's heated up by this current, and then it makes the lamp more <coughs> bright. And 2000 Kelvin is about the maximum you can get roughly for this filament to have a, a decent lifetime. If this filament needs to last for a year, then 2,000 Kelvin is about as much as you can get from um, the most heat-resistant metals like titanium. So uh, this is why with um, incandescent lamps, you get a reddish light. Right. And this is also why with incandescent lamps, you cannot get uh, really white light because then the filament would, would burn out very quickly. So the metal would just evaporate because of the heat. So in order to get something like uh, in the range of um, daylight light, which is around 6,000 Kelvin, you need lamps like LEDs. LEDs doesn't, don't get hot, and the frequency is just determined by some chemical decomposition of um, the LEDs. So that's why with LEDs, you can easily reach daylight wide at um, a black body temperature of about 6,000 Kelvin. For some reason, this is called cold white, even though it's really hotter than the warm white, which is the orange glow. And this is also used for um, basically defining um, the, um, the color of some light. You buy an LED and you see 50,000 Kelvin light color, then you know it's daylight white. And if it says something like uh, 2,000 or 3,000 Kelvin, um, then you know it's the color of an incandescent lamp, a little reddish or orange glow. Yeah. And we see the 6,000 Kelvin as daylight white because. And that's also approximately the temperature of the surface of the sun. Basically, the sun has a composition of its uh, wavelength in such a way that you would see it as a daylight light. Basically, means our eyes adapted or adopted to the sun. The light of the sun, which makes sense because our eyes evolved with a light which is most uh, prevalent on. Uh, daylight surface. Yeah, so how do we predict color mixing with our color space? Yeah, in order to mix two colors, we multiply their coordinates by factors which are between 0 and 1, and the result of the sum should be 1. So, color 1 has two coordinates in this space in this triangle that we just saw. Color 2 also has um, two coordinates, and then we just compute the weighted average in this way. So here, A times color 1 plus B times color 2, where color 1 and color 2 are two dimensional vectors in this space. Yeah. 
one. So we just saw this example. Um, so if we set the factors to sum up to one, then we basically just go through um, this color mixing. So maybe I can try this again. Copy. So here we have the mix, here we have color one, a uh, color two, and this is color one. So here you can see the two colors that we start with, and then we mix them, and we get the mixed color. So when we look at the code, Again, using something still open here. So let's try G edit. So here you can see those two boxes basically with two um, sets of primary colors. This is the first set. This was our reddish color and this was our bluish color here. And then basically here is our mix. You can see the first color gets 3, 0.3 as the factor. The second color, the greenish one, gets 0.7. And that means that our resulting color mix is much closer to color 2, in this case green. And this is also what we saw. The result, the mixing color, was greenish. Um, so it was much, much closer to the original green color that we saw. Make sense? So here basically we didn't change the brightness, we just changed the type of color by mixing with two factors which add up to one. So, well, you can also try this here. Copy. Same thing again. So here if we check that we add up to a sum of 1, then we don't change the brightness. So I'm going to use a three, and the last one should be 0. Right, so in this case, for instance, the sum adds up to 1. Then I can go down, let's see, 0 0.5. So in this case, the mixed color in the middle always has the same brightness if those three factors add up to one. Yeah, and when we see that this, for two colors, two vectors means that we have a, a weighted average then we know when we have a weighted average of two vectors, then it should lie on the connecting line between the two. Right? If the factors are 0.5, it lies right in the middle, 
then one factor is larger than it's closer to one of those. And it's always on this line. So if you then add another color, a third color, so in here, third, that means that we have the mix of the first two, which is somewhere on this line. And now, now we add another third color, and then we have another line, right, between which it can lie, the mix. And that means we have a triangle. So a triangle between the first two and then to the third one. So that means all our color mixes can lie in this triangle. And this basically can be used to determine the color space of a monitor. If we know um, the primary colors of the screen, for instance, um, the, the dyes or the phosphors in the picture cube, uh, tubes, um, then we know what color space this monitor can produce. So this can be seen here. So for instance, you have a monitor which has its primary colors down here in this corner, and here in this corner, and finally here in this green area. And we know it can produce all colors which are spanned by this triangle. It also means it cannot produce colors which are outside in this range here. And that means monitors, displays, are not all created equal. And this is, for instance, why, um, for instance, LED monitors of displays um, usually have a larger color space than cathode ray tubes. Cathode ray tubes have phosphors with certain colors, and LEDs can be designed um, more freely for the desired color. So, for instance, LED displays can have a primary color which is more in this range here, and in this way uh, it can create more saturated green. And this is why sometimes you see demos for um, new monitors um, with uh, green meadows as a test image. Right? Where you can really see this saturated green from the green grass. Right? So you can more easily cover this area. Yeah, and you can also see those numbers here on the outside of this um, triangle-shaped um, form. Do you know what those numbers mean on the outside? Like here you can see 780, 640. Yeah. I suppose it's the right length of uh, the spectral colors. Um, because uh, the graphic states uh, spectral farbline, mm -hmm. which means spectral color line. So this will mean on the blue end it's a 400 nanometers wavelength uh, corresponding if we had a monochromatic source for this color. Right. Excellent. So what's the unit here? 780. What? Do you know? Nanometers. So this is actually the wavelength of pure light, for instance, as emitted by a laser. Right? With a laser you can really emit pure wavelength, very precise, for instance, 780 nanometers wavelength. Does everybody know what one nanometer means? One nanometer is 10 to the minus 9. So it's a thousand micrometer. So 780 nanometers is how much in micrometers? How many micrometers is 780 nanometers? Yeah. 0.78. Yes. Make sense to everybody? So one, uh, one micrometer is 1,000 nanometers. 
because micrometer is 10 to the minus 6, nanometer is 10 to the minus 9, so 1 micrometer is 1,000 nanometer. 10 to the third um, is the ratio. So when we have 780 nanometers, that means we have 0.78 micrometers. So it's a little bit less than 1 micrometer. So you see, this is the longest wavelength that we have here. And uh, this is already very short. It's much smaller than the diameter of the hair. It's tiny. So this is actually on the size of large molecules. And this is also the reason why we see colorful objects, because the surface of objects contains large molecules, and those large molecules uh, might get into resonance with some of those frequencies and accordingly absorbs those frequencies. That means the reflected light doesn't contain all frequencies that are shining on it, and that gives it a color to the eye. Right? Because the reflection has a different composition than the original light So, yeah, and this shows it's actually important that you know, these wavelengths are on the order of large molecules. Yeah, so this goes up actually to about 400 nanometers here. And this is in the um, purple range. Yeah, and here we have theoretical colors. Why are they called theoretical colors? Idea. Why can't we have a color say here? I think they are not visible to our eyes. Yeah, why not? Well, think about it. What would be necessary? It would be necessary to have 0.5 for the red cone and 0.1 for the green cone. Right. So we have a lot of excitation for, for red, but very tiny for green. Can that happen? Do you remember this, those curves, those overlapping curves for the sensitivity of the cones? I think across the curves overlap. Yeah. But it's not possible to excite a certain uh, cone, but at least exciting another one to a tiny amount, so you don't have to see the effects. Exactly. So that's the reason. We have so much overlap that we, we cannot exclusively excite a certain cone. Right? There's always other cones involved. And that's why we have those theoretical cones. We could maybe obtain those theoretical colors if we have a probe in the brain and just excite one cone exclusively, bypassing the cones in the eye. So maybe then we could see it. But not through the eye. Yeah, so here's also an example for how we mix colors. Here, uh, we have two points in this picture, which represent two colors. So here, x1 and this should be y1, I guess. So this is one color, point 0.1 and point 0.1, which you can see here. Point 0.1, this is actually point 0.2. Yeah, 0.2 for x1 and y1, uh, the green component is 0.1. And then color f2 has x 0.55 and y 0.35. So I'll put it back here. Here is 5.5 and here is 3.5. Can you all see it? So here we have those two points, each represented by a pair of coordinates. And then we can compute this mix here um, by just computing the average. So here, in this case, we have the same weight. Each get 0.5 as the weight. 
and then we just um, average that accordingly. So that means we get a new x component as average of the two x's and a new y component as average of the two x's and we get the coordinates for x 0.375 and for y for y 2.0.225 Going back here, here we have 0.375 and here we have 0.225. So this is now indeed our mixing color here in this diagram. And now we can see that we can use this diagram to predict how the resulting color looks like, the mixing color. So this allows us to predict how this color mix looks like without it to be trying it out on our monitor for instance. Yeah, and here's an example of um, three old monitors. Yeah, and we can use this actually to test our monitor. Basically, we can uh, make a Python script which produce all possible colors and then display it on the screen. And then we can take a look at it and then we see what color range our display has. And if we have two displays next to each other, then we can actually compare. Or in my case, I could compare the display on my laptop with a projector here. And actually, you will always see differences. So, what we have to take advantage of is again, the sum here needs to be add up to um, yeah, the three primary colors need to add up to one. And that means we can just make up a two dimensional space using red and green. And then the result is for blue, one minus red minus green. Right, so that's convenient because we can display it in a two-dimensional space like we have on our display. So I did that here with this program, Python program, image color triangle because the result is a triangle. So I copy it, open it in my editor. So here you can see how it works. So again, we make this frame of um, a box, a rectangle, 300 by 300 pixel. And then with D, I make a lint space, which means um, this produces numbers between beginning and end in this many steps. So here it goes from, from 1 to 0 in 300 steps. Um, then I have a matrix of ones of this size 300 by 300 and I multiply it with this D, which means I have a row matrix and I multiply it with this D. So this dodge means um, matrix multiplication. Is everybody familiar with uh, this, this function dot? Do you know what it means? So it's matrix multiplication. Yeah. Does everybody know matrix multiplication? Yeah. Oh, okay. Right. So this will be a matrix. So this is a diagonal matrix here of those values. So that means on it has only values on the diagonal of this matrix, beginning with 1 and then going down with 0. So what happens if we take this diagonal matrix and multiply it with this matrix of 1s? Mm -hmm. 
matrix multiplication to either matrix, and a matrix consisting only of entries of ones. What's the result? It's actually fairly easy. So, matrix multiplication is first row times first column. So, what will we get? First row times first column? R, C1. R1, C1. Well, first we have first, first row of this diagonal matrix with 1 and the rest is zeros. Yeah. First column of the second matrix is all consisting of walls. So, what happens? What's the result of the first row times first column? Zero. Zero. What is it? Uh, row times column means first two entries multiply, multiplied plus second two entries multiplied and so on. Yeah? It's going to be exactly the first line of the diagonal matrix, I think. You know, on the diagonal one on the left and the the matrix with the ones on the right. Right. The yeah. way around. So first first row times first column, what's the result? One. It's one, right? Because you have one times one plus zero times one plus zero times one plus zero times one and so on. Mm -hmm. So all what's left is the first entry of the diagonal matrix. So that's the upper left hand result. Make sense? So then we can take the first row and the second column to get the next entry. What's the first row times the second column? Mm. Yeah, same again, because the second column, same for the third and so on. Yeah. So what's the th first row of the resulting matrix? Mm. It's all nonce. Right? Now we take a value, say in the middle, 0.5 of this diagonal matrix. So we have 0, 0, 0, 0.5, 0, 0, 0. So we have the middle of this diagonal matrix, the row in the middle. Make sense? And we have the right across here. So this is our diagonal matrix. One, then here, say point nine nine. Here we have zero point five. And finally we have zero. And the rest is zero. And then we multiply it with this matrix which consists only of ones. One. So the first row is all ones. Now this one, zeros and 0.5 in the middle. Zero, 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 zero by five. Yeah. More opinions. So we take this row multiplied by this column. What do we get? One. So we have zero, 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 and here we have all ones in this column. So zero by this times this is zero plus zero times one is zero, until we get here, plus 0 0.5 times one, that's 0.5, plus zero times one is again zero, so what's the sum? 0.5. So this times the first column is 0 0.5. Make sense? So next column. What is this row times the second column? Two zero point five. Huh? Zero point five. Yeah, the same, right? So point five, and then the same for the rest because all the columns are the same. Yeah, one more. So here point five. Right. Maybe you can also get it on the video. Okay, great. So, diagonal matrix, this 
descending entries, entries of ones, and this is the result that you can the one. So you can see we now get basically the entries here now in the rows. And here we have the zeros in it. So each row now has a constant but descending value. So this also shows that you maybe should be um, should make you more familiar with matrix multiplications. Right? Because this is actually easy to see if you have some practice. If you have some practice with matrix algebra, then you can immediately see this result. Because when you have a diagonal matrix multiplied with some matrix, that only means you take the diagonal entries and multiply each row with it. This is in general an, an advantage or property of those diagonal matrices. They are really easy with matrix multiplication. It's just row multiplication. Voice multiplication. Make sense? So each entry here is multiplied with the corresponding row. So this is just a trick that I applied to basically make this two dimensional color space. And remember, for this two dimensional color space, we need add all values between 1 and 0 on two dimensions. So this is the first step, getting them all in one dimension. Yeah. So this is this A, right? This is my matrix A, um, this result here. And then the next step, yeah, I'm making frame two. This is the green component from A transpose. So what does that mean? Do you know what split R means? What is split L R? Any idea? I suppose it means drawing the matrix on the vertical axis so that the uh, entry on the right is going to be on the very left and the uh, very right. Yes. So it means flip left right. Exactly as you say, flipping on about the vertical axis. And dot t, what does dot t mean? <coughs> transpose. So what is transpose? Rows change the bottom. Yeah. Rows and columns are exchanged, which means we basically flip it on the diagonal axis. So here what I do is, I first flip it on the diagonal axis, so that means here I get, I start with 1s with my line and then I go down to 0, so the last column now contains the zeros. And when I apply flip R, that means the first column contains the zeros and the last column contains the 1s. So now I have a version which goes up. And this is actually the green component here, which I defined. And, um, no, the blue component. Yeah, this is blue, I guess. Two is blue. One is then the A. This is where I vertically decrease. This should be the green component. And then zero, which should be the red component. I'm not sure. I think here I'm using method, so then the RGB are the other way around. You have to be careful with OpenCV, zero is blue, but with matplotlib, zero is green. So it's kind of confusing, but you just have to keep in mind. So here using matplotlib as display, actually zero is the, uh, the red component. Zero should be the red component. Yes. So here I'm just computing the difference to one. So I have one component increasing from left to right, one component increasing from um, bottom to top, 
and then the final component is just the difference to one. And in this way we get all possible color combinations with constant brightness because they always add up to one, each pixel, at each point. So here you can see it. To avoid negative values from this subtraction here, I use this drill, means triangle, upper, drill, no triangle, okay. one of the triangles, upper or lower. I think this means lower triangle. So then we can let it run. Here with intro, oh yeah, and here we use CD2. So actually, zero is blue. Right, so here, CD2. So I'm not even using that project. Interesting, maybe if I comment it out, it should still work. Okay, so now we can let it run. I think. Yeah, so here we have the lower triangle. This is this drill to avoid negative um, components for display. And here you can see all possible values now that this projector can display. All possible colors. Yeah, the colors on my laptop actually look better. So the colors on my laptop looks, look more saturated. These look slightly less saturated. But the kinds of colors are still the same. So that's good. So in the middle here, you can see um, here is the point where you only have gray. So this is the point where all three components have equal factors. And then here you have the saturated green, here you have the saturated red, and here you have the saturated Make sense? So this is a program which you could also test on your laptop at home or if you have a laptop and a monitor and compare them, see how they look like and see if you see differences. Good for a monitor test. And you can also see this looks very similar to our color triangle that we just saw, except that this is really a triangle, not like the horseshoe that we just saw. Um, but the basic distribution of colors is the same. Right? Lower right hand, you have red. Upper left hand, you have red, uh, blue, green. And lower left hand, you have blue. So Q ends it again. Yeah. And here you could also just select a point with the desired color and then look at the axis or factor it has. Right? And then this way, again, you can determine um, what factors you need for the primary colors to create a certain color on your screen. Questions at this point? So, color mix is basically quite easy, right? So, yeah, this is a good test for um, your laptops at home. So, maybe we'll go to the fourth extra slides. Yeah, so we already saw that those color components, red, green, and blue, can be downsampled because the human eye has less um, spatial resolution for colors com compared to brightness. It has fewer cones uh, than uh, rods. So we saw that we can horizontally and vertically downsample by a factor of two. Um, yeah, this is basically 
what happens also in the retina. And also, um, yeah, so here in the retina we have 110 million rods and 6 million cones that are fed into this 1 billion nerve fibers. So, how do we make this down sampling, for instance, of our color components correctly? And what can go wrong? So, for this, to see this again in experiment in Python. So, again, um, we use the screening of our video signal, but horizontally and vertically, we show only every nth pixel. And in this way, we get a down sampling, down sampling in an effect of n in both directions. Which means we keep only every nth sampling. And in the example, n is 4, so more than we would do for our color example. Right? And this is because then it's easier to see um, the artifacts. So for that, I wrote this Python script video resample.py, and it initializes um, our frame here by reading from the camera. And then it reads out the size of our frame by using dot shape. Dot shape gives us the dimensions of the frame. So here it's rows, columns, and C is the number of colors. In this case, three, because we have a color camera. If we have a monochrome camera, this would be one. Then we have, um, we create a frame of our down sample picture by initializing with zeros and we create it by writing every nth sample of our video picture into it. So initialize with zero but only n every nth pixel horizontally and vertically is now copied from the original frame. So why is the original frame? So here I use this indexing trick. So in Python in general, a comma b comma n means the index starts with a, it goes up to not including b in steps of n. And dropping b means it goes up to the end. Right? For instance, 0 colon colon n means the index, the indices from 0 up to the end in steps of n. And I could actually also drop the zero, then it would automatically start at the beginning. Yeah, so here I do it for both horizontally and vertically directions. Yeah, so now we have a matrix of zeros of the size of our real frame, but only every nth pixel is written horizontally and vertically. So here's an example. Yeah, so here you can see, here it reads our file, our frame, from our camera. Um, I assume that you know the video, this, this um, CV video capture from the seminars, do you? Is this familiar <coughs> to you, video capture, CV2? If you don't ask me, then I can explain a little bit. So, this is what I'm using to read frames from, um, for instance, the webcam that is um, inside my laptop. So here, you can see the initialization, where I read um, the rows and the columns. And here I have my while loop that I keep open until I hit the key Q, where it just 
every time read a frame and yeah what does red what does red say it everything no <laughs> so you're not so familiar with this function no? you should ask if you don't know so that i have the chance to explain it to you Yes. Yeah. yeah, if you don't ask, I don't explain it. You don't ask. So, this basically means uh, this is a return value. And this is true if it was successfully reading the frame. And this is false if it is well, not successfully reading the frame. Okay. So, um, this is good for capturing errors. For instance, the cam if the camera is not connected. So this uh, you could use to catch those, those errors. Here I'm actually ignoring it, and if I'm not connecting the camera, then it will really give me some cryptic errors later. Um, but here I'm taking the risk because this is just an experimental program. Right? So it doesn't really matter. But if you have commercial software, you should catch this error if the camera is not present. And you can do it using this binary um, variable match. So frame, do you know what's in frame? No? The frame the actual image data is stored. No. Right. So frame is the three-dimensional tensor again. Rows times columns times primary colors. So each time you call this function, read, it basically takes a picture from the video camera. For instance, the webcam that's on, in the front frame of your laptop. And since usually those cameras are color cameras, we have the three dimensional tensor. Yeah, and cap here is an object which I created the cv dot video capture and then here this index is basically the index of the camera I'm using. So this can be used if I have more than one camera. Okay, so this is camera one. I think I have no camera one. I think I have one camera three over here. Right? You can use this if you have more than one camera to select which camera you need. Cap is an object and as you know objects can have functions inside. And read is one of the functions inside cap, which you can see here. And wrap cap dot read. This basically executes the function read from the object cap. And cap is this object now connected with my webcam. So basically it takes a picture at the moment when I execute this function. So now I have this tensor and here I'm only interested in the brightness, the Y component. So you still remember the Y component from last time and all of on the game collector. So here I'm just computing the Y component with the corresponding factors for the different color components. So these factors come from the sensitivities of the eye for those different wavelengths. So when you look at this bell shape, the sensitivity curve of the eye, and you look at the different frequencies, that you can, then you can see that the eye has different sensitivities. And from those sensitivities come those factors. So those factors basically mimic the sensitivity of the eye for those different frequencies, of those different colors. Right. So basically you could say Y is kind of an artificial, um, not pole, what is the other? Rod. Right. It's an artificial rod. So that gives you the intensity information of the light. So this is basically our black and white value, and then we downsample this black and white value, the luminance, and we show it here. Original, the, then the luminance, and then the downsample luminance of this camera. So when we execute it. See if it works. I guess it will not work because of the wrong camera number. Yep, indeed. 
See, this is actually the error you get when it doesn't find the camera. Object has no attribute shape. And that's because it didn't create this object. So it also doesn't have this shape from this shape function that it did create. Right. So this is um, then a somewhat cryptic error message that you get from not capturing this return value. So I should change it to zero. You can also leave it open, then it just takes anything that's present in the system. It just takes the first camera. No. Maybe I need to put in a zero here. Yeah, that's good. So I'm taking camera zero. And here you can see original, then so here the original, here the lumens, the black and white version, and here you can see the down sample version. Can you see the difference? It looks quite different, right? Actually it looks somewhat different from my laptop. See this, this kind of Strikes and don't really have on my laptop. It's kind of fun. Seems to be an artifact from the projector. Yeah, and actually, then you can also see funny artifacts if you put fine patterns in front of it. Bless you. I brought a few examples here. Yeah. So this is an example of a fine pattern, and you can imagine, depending on where I sample, it makes different outputs. And so this is actually difficult for stone sample. So can you see those moving waves on the down sample version? Yeah. yeah. So this is uh, the kind of artifacts that can happen. Uh, when you don't do the downsampling right, you get those funny artifacts which are called more or aliasing. Right? So you get frequencies in the image which were then not before. Right? Here, this up and down is a new frequency which is just created by the interaction of this image and the downsampling. Because it depends. The brightness depends where I downsample. If I sample at the dark point or at the white point. So if my sampling points are, for instance, always on the white points, then I have a white frame if it's in between. If it's on black point, it's, it's dark. Or if it's slowly moving, then it's slowly bright and dark. And this is what we see here. See the principle of downsampling. I'm just keep keeping every fourth sample here in this case, and the rest is zero. Yeah, so we just tried it. Only some pixels survived, but the content is somewhat recognizable, I would say. Right? Yeah, then I just used this picture and this test image here which I actually produce using the code that you see here on the next page. And it consists of a sine wave with 100 cycles over 1000 pixels. And I just printed it out. So basically what you could see here is sine wave, a sine wave in brightness. It goes up and down in brightness. So this is how I made it. Here, this is my sine wave. I needed to, uh, to add a 1 to avoid the negative numbers, so that is always positive. And then I have the sine wave here, produced with this linear space from 0 to 2 pi. So from 0 to 2 pi would be one wave. But now I'm gonna, I want to have f equals 100 waves, so I have to multiply by f. And I'm using 1000 pixel points here. 
and I divide by 2 to get it in the range from 0 to 1 because that's what we can see it expects for flows. Yeah, and as a result, we produce 500 equal lines. <coughs> Should be 100. Or is it 500? So we have 100 up and downs and repeated 500 times. So we get a rectangular image. 1000 pixels wide, 500 pixels high. So this is what we do here. Here's again our rectangle, 500 pixels high. 1000 pixels wide. And here we again do this trick with a diagonal. Here D is our diagonal, the sine wave. It's just now that we compute the diagonal from the right hand side. And so we get the same colors. So that we have the stripes vertical, as you can see here. Vertical stripes. So we can actually make this file using this Python program. So I can show it to you this test program, gedit. So here you can see the sine wave, here's the diagonal matrix produced from the sine wave, and here we have this matrix product starting from the ones of the desired size, and indeed the diagonal matrix multiplied from the right, which means we get um, our identical rows, uh, colors. Yeah, and then we display it here with imshow. And finally we write it to this JPEG file using imwrite. So here you can see it. Imshow displays it to our display. Imwrite writes it to the JPEG file which we can then convert. So when I execute it Yeah, so here we have now a test image which has 100 brightness cycles across the width of our test image. Right. Width of the lines or rows. So lines is what you use in analog TV basically. And in order to distinguish this frequency that we have in our test image from time frequencies or temporal frequencies, which is usually denominated in oscillations per second or hertz, we call it spatial frequency. Right? So this is an example of a spatial frequency and this is now relevant for pictures and video. Right? In pictures and video we don't have much time frequencies but we have spatial frequencies. Same concept but in a different uh, dimension. 
It's not a time dimension, but space dimension. And you know from Einstein that time and space is basically just different dimensions. Yeah, and the unit here is cycles per some length. And here would be the width of our lines or the rows. Yeah, and instead of the length, what we usually use is the angle under which our rows appear to the viewer. And then we get the unit cycles per degree. Right? And this is usually what's relevant for psycho-optic effects for the eye. So this is what you most usually see um, in the literature. It's always cycles per degree. And that basically tells you how many lines or dark, brightness, darkness you see within one degree as measured from the point of the observer, of the eye. Yeah, so using this test image, as we just did, um, we can see a new pattern of wavy lines uh, with slower light dark fluctuations, which now have no resembles or resembling or resemblance to the original. So we call these more or alias. So this is an artifact which appears from down set. Yeah, and if you hold those stripes. Closer to the uh, to the camera, so that they appear larger, which means fewer brightness changes or cycles. Fewer. Then the aliasing or more effects or artifacts disappear. So if this pattern is large enough, then we have no problem. But if this pattern appears smaller to the camera, that is the point where we get problems. So that means we need high spatial frequencies in order to have this problem. Make sense? So if you don't have any fine pattern, it means only low spatial frequencies, then we are fine. But if we have high spatial frequencies, fine pattern, then we get those um, aliasing. So here's also an example of a photo of a brick wall, and this brick wall, because of the brick, contains a fine pattern. And when you take a photo, it does sampling, and pixel by pixel sampling of this picture. And then again, you have this problem. This fine picture, but these fine patterns in the picture result then in this moiré effect. And that's because of this slow shifting of sampling points compared to the picture pattern. And again, you can see these wavy lines. Recognize it? So the same that we just saw in our experiment. Yeah, this is actually from Wikipedia on Moray. So, any more questions on this? I think before we come to the retina, this is a good uh, point to hopefully until next time. Yeah, so as I mentioned, check Moon for what happens with the next lesson. Okay, then, thanks for your attention and have a nice afternoon.